Father, we are grateful for the many good things that you give to us. Every good and perfect gift comes down from you, James says, from the Father above. You've been incredibly good to us. We, uh, we have so much. The, the man here this evening in the weakest position financially, well, most people in the world would look at him and say that he lives like a king. We, uh, we have food. We have shelter. We have, uh, we have water. We have hot water. And we just take it for granted. I mean, it's what we have. You've been so good. So we thank you for that. We also have difficulties and hardships and pressures. We have things in our lives that we wish you would take away. We have predicaments. We sometimes feel stuck. We feel like we're not progressing. We, we feel that we are being delayed by what we need to do. But it is in those hard situations that you work. We don't tend to grow when we're on vacation. But we grow when we're in boot camp. And we develop character when we're in hard places. And we are hemmed in. And we've got to make decisions about what we're going to do with our lives and who we're going to trust and what kind of men we're going to be in private and not just in public. We grow through the hard times. Uh, every man in here has prosperity and adversity. It all comes from you, Ecclesiastes 7 says. Consider the work of God who can straighten what he has bent. In the day of prosperity, be glad, and we are. In the day of adversity, consider. For God has made the one as well as the other. Help us, Lord, to learn the lessons. Help us to be teachable right where we are. Help us to remember that wherever we are, we are there by your appointment. We probably won't always be there, but we are there now. It's the season that we are in, but seasons change. But help us to be teachable in each season, no matter how difficult, so that we can develop into the men you want us to be. We thank you tonight for the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his death on the cross that paid for our sin. Thank you that because of what Jesus did, dying in our place, we can have peace with you forever. That we have eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Of all men on the earth, we are most blessed. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are continuing in our study on the Ten Commandments. We're still camped on the Seventh Commandment. Uh, you shall not commit adultery. I'll just do a little short review, and I mean short. That commandment, you shall not commit adultery, as we've said in past weeks, is designed by the Lord to protect marriage because marriage is the fundamental building block of all cultures, in all times, in all nations, throughout history. It's the fundamental building block. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. 
When marriage falls apart, people get hurt. People get damaged. No one wins. So the Lord has established marriage from the very beginning, from the very creation. He established marriage. The great threat to marriage is adultery. When adultery occurs in a marriage, bad things happen. The first thing that happens is that trust is lost. And there is a breach. And once trust is lost, it takes a long, long time to get it back. I'm going to say close to 30 years ago, I was doing a marriage conference. And after the conference, a couple came up to me and asked if I could talk with them for a few minutes. And I said, I've got about 30 minutes before I have to go to the airport. We sit down in the coffee shop. And, and the, the guy, he was probably 35, immediately said, well, let me just give you the summary of what's happened. And he said, I, we're Christians. We've been here all weekend. I, uh, I committed adultery with my secretary. Uh, it's all on me. It's my fault. We, I have cut it off. She has taken employment in another place. I have no contact with her. I'm trying to make this right with my wife. Uh, I've confessed it to the Lord. I've confessed it to my wife. The problem is my wife refuses to trust me. And she's sitting right next to him. And you learn pretty fast, there's always two sides to a story. And she'd been quiet the whole time, and I looked at her, and she said, well, that's true. I'm, I have trouble trusting him, because you see, this is the third time this has happened. And, and I looked at the guy, and I said to him, if the roles were reversed, would you be trusting her? I said, I don't even know you and I don't trust you. <laughs> That's what I told him. I said that you would be sitting here expecting to be trusted. Because you see, number one, I mean, I was listening to you. And then your wife put in an interesting fact and you see, I don't trust you at all. Because why didn't you come clean with the whole story? You only gave a portion of the story. I mean, we don't have much time here, but I'm just being real upfront with you that this is not how you build trust. This isn't how you do it. You gotta come clean. You gotta come clean like Psalm 51 like David did, and nothing hidden, bring everything that's in the darkness into the light. <sighs> I don't know what happened to that couple, but when adultery happens three times with a Christian couple who had been married probably six, seven, eight years, that's tough because trust has been lost. And there are ramifications and there are consequences. Adultery can be forgiven if there's true and genuine repentance. Not, uh, not false repentance, not fake repentance because you got caught, but genuine repentance from the heart. A broken and contrite spirit God will not despise. Thomas Watson said that authentic repentance is the vomiting of the soul. It's the dry heaves. You ever had the dry heaves? For 10, 12 hours, what a wonderful experience that is. Now that is genuine repentance, where you loathe your sin and what you have done. And when the Lord sees that and we turn to him, gosh, wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How can my tongue describe it? Where shall his praise begin? That's the gospel. 
But God wants to protect marriage. He can heal marriages where adultery has taken place, but there's got to be honesty. Tonight, the title of this message is Running Away from Cheap Sex. It is a paraphrase of 1 Corinthians 6.18, which simply says, flee immorality. Flee immorality. Now, how in the world did I come up with running away from cheap sex? Well, because I've been reading a book called Cheap Sex by a guy named Mark Regnerus, who is a researcher uh, with a study tank out of the University of Texas. He, is, um, he just does research and reports the facts. And this is, this is a, a fascinating book because he talks about the state of marriage and the sexual climate in, in our country at this, um, at this moment in time. On the flap, it says, sex is cheap. Coupled sexual activity has become more widely available than ever. Cheap sex has been made possible by two technologies that have little to do with each other. The pill and high quality pornography. And its distribution has been made more efficient by, th by a third technological innovation, online dating. Together, they drive down the cost of real sex and in turn slow the development of love, make fidelity more challenging, sexual malleability more common, and have even taken a toll on men's marriage ability. And in the early sections, he just talks about history, history, uh, the history, the history of marriage. It used to be that the only way that a man, and men have very strong sex drives, that the only way a man could fulfill that sex drive, generally speaking, was to get married. Uh, there, there was no digital porn, there was no online dating, there was, for thousands of years, uh, you would hit 15 or 16 and you were a marriageable young man, and it was time to go to work and it was time to have a family, because most men would die by the time they were in their 40s. So you start looking for a wife. So you'd see a young lady, maybe who lived on the farm, you know, half mile away, and you would start to court her and you would take her to Starbucks and it's not what you do. If you wanted to go get with her, you had to ask the permission of her father and then you would go over and sit on the front porch with her father and her mother and her 14 brothers and 16 sisters and 97 cousins. You were never by yourselves, never, until your wedding night. So in order to win her, you had to be responsible and you had to take initiative and you had to demonstrate your character and you had to make a commitment and they would check you out and they would ask family members. They, you were already known because you're in a small community and everybody talks in a small community. But see, those days are gone. So as a result, we have cheap sex. It's astonishing when you read his research, and it's just research, and it's fascinating stuff. How many couples who start a relationship, it's amazing how many couples have sex the first or second time they're together. It's amazing how many have sex before they ever have a relationship. It's what's called a hookup culture. You'll just meet at a party or a bar and you just hook up. You may not even know last names. It's where we are. Uh, marriage is on the decline. We're not replacing our birth rate. Uh, sex is cheap. Women are giving it away to irresponsible guys. Yep. And some guys who are responsible. But it's, it's the total breakdown of what God designed for marriage in our culture. That's where we are.
we made the statement in here that the primary pathway to adultery for marriage, and it should be noted that for a while now, the statistics on marriage and divorce, the divorce rate among Christians is slightly higher than non-Christians. It's a tragedy. But it should be pointed out that the pathway, the main pathway to adultery in our culture, in our time, is pornography. Now, as we begin tonight, I want to give you two principles, and then I want to give you five observations. It's a lot of stuff. So let's just, uh, let's dive into this stuff. As we talk about running away from cheap sex. First principle. So two principles up front and then five observations. The first principle. The more you engage with pornography, the more desensitized you become to sin. All sin. I'll say it again. The more you become engaged with pornography, the more desensitized you become to sin. I mentioned the website Covenant Eyes. They, it's designed to help men fight pornography. It's an excellent site with many resources and helps. You can access, you can download something they put together called the Porn Circuit. It's a 90-day program that'll walk you through steps uh, to help you in fighting pornography in your life. I'll just quote a couple of things. They have a section called the Broadband Stream of Pornography. Our modern culture delivers a constant flood of sexualized media and pornography that wears at the banks of the mind. In decades past, pornography was limited in availability, especially to minors, but the advent of the internet ensures hardcore and fetish porn is always available to an ever younger audience. They quote a psychologist, Al Cooper, who, who said the modern allure of pornography was driven by a triple A engine, three A's. Porn is available, it is affordable, and it is anonymous. They have some statistics, some graphs. It's heartbreaking. The largest consumers of internet pornography are kids ages 12 to 17. A couple of stats. 9% of girls and 15% of boys in this range have seen child pornography. Child pornography. That anyone would see child pornography. 18% of girls and 32% of boys have viewed bestiality on the internet. That's one out of three boys between 12 and 17. That's astonishing. That's tragic because those images never leave your mind. 57% of the girls and 83% of the boys have seen group sex on the internet. We're living in days of exceptional evil. 55% of girls and 69% of boys have seen porn showing same-sex intercourse. That's half the girls it's over two-thirds of the guys. 23% of girls and 39% of boys have seen online sex acts involving bondage. And then we wonder what's happening to this country. Psalm 11.3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? I mean, it's, uh, it's overwhelming. It's, uh, it's, it's cheap sex. It's cheap sex. Just a quote from Regnerus. You may have noticed, and again, the principle, the more you engage with pornography, the more desensitized you become to sin. Regnerus uh, talks about there was, a, there was a pretty quick shift in America, and it wasn't too long ago, where the majority of people indicated they were against gay marriage. 
And in a matter of a few short years, there was a complete flip-flop. How did that happen? He has a section called this porn shape LGBT support. And basically, he demonstrates from the research that it does. I'll just jump into the middle of a paragraph. Of the men who view pornography every day or almost every day, 43% strongly agreed that gay and lesbian marriage should be legal. Compared with around 12% of those whose porn use patterns were either monthly or less often than that. So the more you engage with it, the more desensitized you become. And see, this desensitization has been going on for quite a while. So <clears throat> I, I did this book in 1990 called Point Man, and I'm revising it. I mentioned this to you. And this past week I was working on the chapter called Real Men Don't. Um, there was a book out a long time ago, <clears throat> Real Men Don't Eat Quiche. And they had some funny lines in there. Real men don't call for a fair catch. I like that too. Uh, real men don't get manicures. Uh, real men, you know, anyway, it's messing around. Well, my, I was writing on real men don't commit adultery. And I'm just going through it and I'm trying to update some stories and all that. And there was a section in there I'd forgotten that was in there. And it was called desensitization. And I thought, well, that's interesting because, see, the stuff I'm teaching tonight, I was supposed to teach last week, but I lost my voice entirely, so I didn't teach it. But I had this stuff on desensitization, and there it was in Point Man, and I'd forgotten about it. And I was talking about adultery and how we kind of gloss it over and we varnish it and we, it's no big deal. You know, hey, it, it's this, we, there's a sexual revolution. It's okay as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. And, you know, it doesn't have to hurt anybody. It's just two adults, consenting adults. It's okay. Da, da, da. And, you know, you meet and you have a dinner and you go to a hotel and you have your wine and your romantic dinner. And then you go up quietly to a room. And at a certain point, the man inserts his penis into her vagina. And I read that. I'd forgotten I had that in there. I put that in there 30 years ago. <clears throat> I remember I was shocked that the publisher didn't take it out. But the reason John Van Dees didn't take it out was the next line. I said, the reason I just made that statement, which I'm sure shocked you, is to prove that we've been desensitized to adultery. Because by reading that last statement, we're more offended by the fact that I use the word penis and the word vagina than we are by the word adultery because we just varnished it. It's just got layers of varnish and it's no big deal. But you see, it is kind of shocking. Gosh, my gosh, that's kind of... And it is shocking. And it's stunning. And it is a gross betrayal of a sacred relationship. <clears throat> Let me give you a second principle. The second principle. So, so does exposure, does all of this exposure, what these kids are seeing on porn, the more porn you see, does it desensitize? Yes. It can't help but desensitize. So what happens is you become comfortable with sin and you become comfortable with more and more and more sin. Most guys who get into porn just don't stay where they are. Some do, but the majority have got to have more and more and more titillating and more violence and more all kinds of stuff because the thrill is gone. Second principle, the more that you are engaged with Scripture, the more you are able to discern between good and evil. Let me say that again. The more you are engaged with Scripture, the more you are able to discern between good and evil. We're going to go to Hebrews 5. Uh, and I'm going to, don't go there yet. 
I, I want to make a statement. I, uh, I have been shocked, and I've said it before in here. With all the presidential politics and the division, and it's everywhere, it used to be that Christians as a whole, generally speaking, in past years have been united on who they'd vote for. That's all out the window. We saw it in the last election. What's astonishing to me is how many Christians I've run into in Bible-believing churches who had a great aversion to one of the candidates who has actually proven himself to be pro-life. They had no problem voting for the candidate who had a history of approving abortion and partial birth abortion and the dismemberment and decapitation of children in the womb. And now the true colors are coming out this past week. They're not stopping there. They're not stopping in the womb. They don't care if the baby is born, they'll still kill it. I'm amazed how many Christians who sit in Bible-believing churches don't like the language of this guy over here, and I would agree with, I would agree, he's no Billy Graham. But I would also say, look at who you're supporting. Look at the wickedness, look at the evil, look at the absolute murder of children. What in the world are you thinking? They're not thinking, and I'll tell you what else they're not doing. They are not interacting with Scripture. But what happens is Christians who are just Christian in name only, and as we said last week, you might revere the Bible, but you don't read the Bible, you're in trouble. Let's do go to Hebrews 5, and I'm going to just show you the verse, and we'll come back to it later. In Hebrews chapter 5, this is all about desensitization. And when we're not in the Word of God, what happens is we get overwhelmed by the world and by the world's thinking. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, which would be contained in Scripture. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, Watch this, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern between good and evil. If you're not in the scriptures, you've got no moral compass. If you're not in the scriptures, you will be overwhelmed by the world. Romans 12, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, the, 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 it is absolutely critical that we be feeding on Scripture in order to fight off. Because in Scripture, I find out what God says and I find out what God thinks. And he's the authority. And he is righteous and he is good and he is just. There is no injustice with God. He is morally pure. He is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. How blessed is the man who walks not, Psalm 1. How blessed is the man who walks not, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. That's the world system. That's whatever websites you look at. That's whatever university you went to. Unless they were built on the word of God and still preach the Bible. It's secularization. And see, it's just constant. It's constant. It's constant. You breathe it in. Our kids breathe it in. The only way to counter it is by interacting with the word of God and put it in our hearts and minds because then I'm in alignment with what God says, with what God says in the Ten Commandments. What does God say righteousness is? You see? Not some guy who went to the university of whatcha whatcha and got a medical degree and as a governor, you know, they're mass murderers. That's what they are. They're killers. They're highly educated, well-paid, sophisticated killers who bathe in the blood of babies. And the only way you counter that is by being in the Word of God. 
Okay, those are the first two principles. So I start, we, we'd, we'd start light tonight, okay? <laughs> now, let me give you five observations, and here we go. I'm gonna give them to you, then we'll come back and work them through. Number one, so what are we talking about tonight? Running away from cheap sex, which is another way of saying, 1 Corinthians six eighteen, flee immorality. Run from it. Run from adultery, run from porn. Get out of there as fast as you can. All right, here's number one. We flee immorality by killing sin. We flee immorality by killing sin. I'll come back to it. Here's number two. We flee immorality by focusing on God's grace. Here's number three. We flee immorality by removing options. We flee immorality by removing options. Number four. We flee immorality by refusing to drink milk. Hebrews 5. Number five, we flee immorality by feeding on solid food of Scripture. I'll come back to it. Let's go to number one. We flee immorality by killing sin. On May 1st, 2003, Aaron Ralston, a 27-year-old backpacker, did something unthinkable to save his life. After being pinned for five days by an 800-pound boulder in a remote Utah canyon, he took his dull pocket knife and cut off his right arm to free himself. He tried chipping away at the rock at first, but it wouldn't budge. Finally, he realized that he had only two choices. Either he must cut off his arm or he would die. On the fifth day, hungry and dehydrated, he sawed through the flesh just below the elbow in order to free himself. He walked out of that canyon without his right arm, but with his life. This is the exact picture that Jesus gives us when telling us how to deal with sin that remains in our lives. Tom Askell, A-S-C-O-L, has written this article called Kill Your Sin. And then he quotes from Matthew 5. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Uh, Askell says, and he's right here, Jesus is not speaking literally. If you steal with your right hand, then simply amputating it will not cure you of thievery. You could continue stealing with your left hand. And if you remove your right eye because it's been an instrument of lusting, you still have your left eye that can be used for the same purpose. Our Lord's words were intended to shock us into recognition of the seriousness with with which we must deal with the sin that remains in our lives as believers. We must treat it ruthlessly. We must be willing to give up even good things, analogous to eyes and arms, in our effort to put sin to death. I'm not going to spend much time on this because two weeks ago, I talked for a while, on killing sin. Romans six thirteen. If by the Spirit we are putting to death the deeds of the flesh, we shall live. It's what the Puritan pastors called mortifying sin, killing sin. John Owen said, either we be killing sin or sin will be killing us. So we talked about the importance of aggressively attacking when you're tempted of fighting, of not being a Pillsbury Doughboy, but fighting sin, being a Dick Dick Butkus linebacker who takes temptation on and fights. The thing is, you don't stop fighting. Are you going to be victorious? 100%? No. And that's, it would sure be nice to be victorious, wouldn't it, without sin on this earth? But we're going to struggle with sin. It's Romans 7. If you look at Romans 7, the things, and this is Paul, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And we can all, and, and, and we're so frustrated with ourselves. But you can't stop fighting. Um, Andy Nacelli said this. He quoted John Newton. He said, this is why John Newton, the former slave trader who wrote the song Amazing Grace, encapsulated the Christian life with this pithy statement. I am not what I ought to be, 
I am not what I wish to be. I am not what I hope to be, yet I am not what I once was. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's a great statement. We'll be perfected in heaven. Until then, we're still going to have to fight off sin. And we talked about sin being that old man. Sin used to be a Godzilla in our lives. Dominated our lives. Uh, scared us, frightened us. We had to do what Godzilla said. But then Jesus comes into our lives. And now he's our Lord and our master. And the spirit of God lives within us. Sin is still with us, but Godzilla is now a 105-year-old man in a wheelchair with all kinds of tubes and a breathing apparatus, and he hardly has any blood pressure, and I mean, the guy's just barely alive. You don't want to feed him. You want to kill him. You don't want to give him water. You don't want to give him Gatorade. You don't want to give him a Hostess Twinkie. You want to kill that sucker. You don't want him to get stronger. You want him to get weaker and weaker. So we have to get aggressive. Let's go to number two. We flee immorality by focusing on God's grace. That's really the quote that I just read from Newton. What it really is all about is focusing on the grace of God and the forgiveness of God and the encouragement of God. First Corinthians 6, 9. This is a fascinating passage. It describes the church of Jesus Christ. Paul says, or do you not know that the unrighteous, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, that's adultery, or idolaters, nor adulterers. And fornication is not just having sex Adultery is having sex with someone else's wife when you're married. Uh, fornication would be any kind of sexual immorality outside of the marriage relationship between two single people. So, let me start it again. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. That would be the passive individual in a homosexual relationship. Nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. No way. Next verse. Such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. That means to be set apart. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. That's grace. The great slave trader John Newton. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. He raped women on the ship. He murdered people, throwing them overboard. When he said to save a wretch like me, he meant it. He could not fathom. He, it was unbelievable to him, the amazing grace of God. He never got over it. His whole life, he would say, I am a great sinner, but Jesus is a great savior. Could he have not been locked up completely locked up with regret and remorse so that he never accomplished anything for the kingdom? Absolutely. He could have been paralyzed by his past. But you see, you flee immorality by focusing on God's grace and what Jesus has done. Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a verse you want to get tattooed on your forehead. No condemnation. And every time you feel condemned, you quote Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, and I am in Christ Jesus. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? Jesus paid it all. Yes, he did. Is there any better news in the world than all of that? It's the greatest news in the world. Number three. We're talking about running away from cheap sex. We're talking about fleeing immorality. Here's number three. You flee immorality by removing options. By removing options. Um, I 
<clears throat> there is a responsibility in Scripture put upon men to lead their families. We talk about this all the time in here. There is a responsibility to give, um, to impart wisdom. There is a responsibility given to men to train their children up in the discipline and admonition of the Lord. It's, all, it's everywhere in the Bible. What is important before you attempt to teach this is that you're actually doing it in your own life. So much of the Christian life is making choices and saying no to wrong and saying yes to what God says is right. The, the lie of our culture is you can have it all, you can do it all, you can experience it all. No, you can't. You don't want it all. Why would you want it all? What you want is what God wants. What you want is what God says is best. He is our loving Father. Um, part of the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, you might want to flip over there for a minute, 519 of Galatians. Now the deeds of the flesh, and the flesh is not your skin. It's that residue of sin that still lives within us. It's that emaciated old man in the wheelchair with the tubes that you don't want to feed, okay? It's the sin nature. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outburst of angers, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, things like these, which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice, 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 Practice. Just keep doing it, doing it, doing it. Don't have a problem with it. You just keep doing it. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because the spirit of God is not within them. They haven't been regenerated. Now watch 22. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Such, against such things there is no law. When I say here in number three, flee immorality by removing options, I'm talking about the concept of self-control. And let me give you two ways that fathers and grandfathers should do this. Let me give you two verses. The first one is Job 31, verses one and two. Where, you, you know, we hear people, I just want to keep my options open. No, you don't. You want to remove options. You have to remove options in your life. I've used this illustration many times. If uh, you and your wife didn't communicate about how you were using the Visa card and the bill comes in and you try to pay it off every month and you're 800 bucks over and uh, you're looking at the budget and paying bills and you're 800 short, is it an option for you to go down to the 7-Eleven with a handgun and stick them up and rob 7-Eleven and say, I don't want everything, just give me 800 bucks? That's ridiculous. Uh, you wouldn't do, I mean, looking around, most of you have removed that as an option. A little humor there, 6-0, a little humor. Anyway, just a little humor. Yeah, armed robbery is not an option for you. You haven't kept the option of armed robbery open. And maybe in the past you did, but Christ has come into your life and no more because, as Ephesians says, let him who steals steal no longer. Why? Because Christ is in you and you're a new creation and Jesus is in you. You don't do that anymore. You see, you remove the option. Job 31, Job says, I have made a covenant with my eyes that I will not gaze upon a young woman in lust. That's not an option for him anymore. Now that's our natural tendency. Whatever the situation, you see a gal, you see something, a picture, what, you, you, I'm not, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
I will not gaze upon a young woman in lust. You remove that as an option. And those around you who know you and who watch your life see it. You're teaching by your life. You're teaching by your character. You're teaching by your choices. Now, you teach with your lips, but you're also teaching with your life. Uh, Another one would be Psalm 101, verses 2 and 3. And this certainly applies to our day with pornography and pay-per-view movies that come into our homes through these channels. Psalm 101, verses uh, 2 and 3, I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. Psalm 101, verses 2 and 3, I'll walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. Even It's easy to do when everybody's up. It's, every, it's easy to do when grandma's there. When you're watching TV with grandma, it's easy to do when all the kids are there and the grandkids. You're not going to set any worthless thing before your eyes. But when everybody's in bed and you're there by yourself, there's the temptation. And what has to happen is you kill sin by removing options. That's not an option for me anymore. That's fighting sin. Let's go to number four. You flee immorality by refusing to drink milk. And this obviously is related to the Hebrews 5 passage, which we'll go to in a minute. And then right with it is number five. You flee immorality by feeding on the solid food of Scripture. Now, let's let's go back to Hebrews one more time. Because we talked last week, actually two weeks ago, we talked about anorexia and we talked about bulimia in the Christian life. In the Christian life, anorexia, well, let's talk about it just in real life, physically. It affects primarily young women. And for whatever reason, they view themselves, they see themselves in the mirror and they think they're overweight and obese. They're not. No one else thinks that, but they do. And they begin to starve themselves. And it's a tragic thing to watch. And some of you have had this happen in your families and it's heartbreaking. It, it, kills, it kills young girls, young women. Now, how can you be anorexic spiritually? You can be anorexic spiritually by revering the Word of God, by by having a Bible, by going to a Bible-teaching church. But you revere the Bible, but you never read the Bible. You never feed on the Bible. That's anorexia. Keep your finger, if you're in Hebrews 5, keep it there, but then also turn over to Matthew 4, 4. Because in Matthew 4.4, 4, what is happening in Matthew 4.4 4 is that Jesus is being tempted by Satan. Matthew 4, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. Now watch this. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. Notice how Satan uses scripture. He'll twist it. He will command his... Satan knows more scripture than you do. Than anybody, any of us. I mean, he can quote it. But he has a tendency to twist it and manipulate it 
for a meaning other than what was intended. He takes him to the pinnacle. If you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You don't want to debate the word of God with God. You don't want to do that. Because he wrote the book. And then he said, verse 9, he took, or 8, he took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said to him, all these things I'll give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Every time Jesus was tempted, he responded with the word God. If you don't know scripture, you can't fight off sin. You can't do it. If you're not feeding, Matthew 4.4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If you're not feeding on the word of God, you're anorexic. You have no strength because you have no nutrition. You're weak. You're sickly. You're fragile. You can't think straight. You can't fight. You don't have the capacity to fight. You don't have the energy to fight. You see why the enemy wants to keep us from Scripture? It's amazing to me, every time I go to pick up my Bible in the morning, I get resistance. Or I get distracted. Or I get, oh, 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 oh but oh, every time. Every time. It never, I've always got to fight to get into the Scripture. Because he doesn't want me in Scripture. He doesn't want you in Scripture. So then what do we have to do? We have to fight. This is serious stuff. How can you overcome an addiction to pornography if you're not in the Word of God? You can't. You can't do it. And then we talked about bulimia. Bulimia is where someone binges, you know, eats the entire Thanksgiving turkey and all the dressing and mashed potatoes, and then they excuse themselves and, you know, go into the restroom and vomit it all up. Well, that's no good either because there's no nutrients. All the nutrients are out of the system. There's no digestion. There's no digestion. A spiritual anorexic is someone who never reads the word of God. A spiritual bulimic is someone who hears the word of God, but doesn't do the word of God. They don't apply it to their lives. Now, what you have in Hebrews 5 is a balanced nutritional program in Hebrews 5. That's what you got. If you go back to Hebrews 5, you will notice that Hebrews 5 follows Hebrews chapter 4. Now, you don't get this kind of teaching in many places. I like to state the obvious. We've read 5. We'll go back to 5. I want to read 4. It's interesting to me that in 4.12, <clears throat> you read this. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. What do you do with a sword? You fight. You fight. Keep your finger there. This is called Bible study. This is okay. Scripture interprets scripture. So if you go over to Ephesians 6... Verse 11, put on the full armor of God that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes, against the strategies of the devil. One of the strategies of the devil is to keep me from reading and meditating on the word of God. Watch this. 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. There are dem demonic powers. A third of the angels fell with Satan in rebellion. And they are the demons. And you can't see them, but they're there and they're real. They're, they're real. Thirteen. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you will be able to resist in the evil day. We're living in evil days. When kids are watching this kind of pornography, your kids and your grandkids, you don't think they're going to see this stuff? They are. So that you will be, take up the full armor that you will be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, they had a belt. Everything hung off the belt. The belt was critical. You see a police officer, he's got a belt. He's got all kinds of stuff that's important hanging off that belt. You gird your loins with truth. How do you gird your loins with truth? Right here. You put on your belt the truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of, feet, of, of peace. So footwork is critical. They had a special type of sandal that Roman soldiers would wear back then. I'm not going to get into this. Uh, look at 16. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation. Watch this, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. There is one offensive weapon mentioned here. Everything else is defensive. The one offensive weapon is the what? The sword, which is the Word of God. So the pulpit's gone, but usually when the pulpit's here, Chuck had this beautiful carving done. Of, in the background is an open Bible, and then in front of it, beautifully done, is a sword. So you go back to Hebrews 4 now. See how Scripture interprets Scripture? For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. There's no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He talks about Jesus, what Jesus has done for us. Go to 16, because it's about grace. That's another way you fight off sin. We looked at that earlier, but it's good to read. Therefore, let us draw with confidence to the throne of grace. That we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. It's all about grace. Now go down to Hebrews 5. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. He's an infant. He's a spiritual baby. He's immature. He's not a self-starter in the Christian life. You can, be, you can be 50 years old and 50 years in church and be a spiritual infant. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So I want to read something to you that's so good. I just thought I'd read it to you. Dennis Johnson is commentary in the book of Hebrews. We'll just dive in here. He says, talking about there's educational imagery here. He says, extending the educational imagery, they need to be sent back to the beginning. Basic principles represent the Greek idea of alphabet, which can refer to a language's alphabet, the starting point of learning to read. What he is saying is, these people in Hebrews 
are like children in the kindergarten who, unable to read or write, have to start at the very beginning by learning their ABCs. And it's possible they've been faithful attenders, members, have Bibles with their names engraved, but they never open them up. They're still doing A, B, C, D, E, F, E, H, I, J, K, L, M, O, P. You're 50 years old. You got to get out of, hey man, you got to get that alphabet and you got to get some basic, you got to get some basic stuff going here. And then he says, at the end of verse 12, the imagery shifts, the imagery shifts from the school classroom to the family dining room where infants imbibe milk while solid food is reserved for the mature. The child who lives on milk is very young, an infant not yet able to chew solid food. Chorus, solid food corresponds to the rich instruction that our preacher wishes to impart in Hebrews. It's the word of righteousness. It has a strong ethical component since the mature, watch this, have moral discernment to distinguish good from evil. How do you get discernment? By the word of God. That's how you get it. He goes on and says, discernment is accurate, perception of reality, enabling one to weigh the relative value of alternative courses of action and choose what is superior. That's brilliant. <laughs> is that not brilliant? I love that stuff. Discernment is accurate perception of reality, enabling one to weigh the relative value of alternative courses of action and choose what is superior. So, you thought I was done. So Proverbs is all about a father teaching his son. First nine chapters. My son, my son, my son, my son, my son. It's a father teaching his son about all kinds of things in life, including the adulteress. If you look at Proverbs 5, <clears throat> my son, give attention to my wisdom, Incline your ear to my understanding. Watch this, verse three. The lips of an adulteress drip honey and smoother than oil is her speech. Ah, but in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Six, she doesn't ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable, she doesn't know it. You know what he's doing? He's instructing them about sexual immorality and adultery. And he is describing to them the snares and the temptations and the enticements. And now he's going to tell them uh, what's going to happen if you follow this and you end up in this. Verse 8, keep your way far from her. Don't go near the door of her house. They didn't have digital porn back then. They just had cheap women. Stay away from them. They're bad news. They're enticing. Oh, man, they look great. They look unbelievable. Whether it's porn or whatever it is, or a real woman, or it's, it looks good. But there is a price. There is a cost. Don't go near her house, or you will give your vigor to others and your years to the cruel one. Strangers will be filled with your strength. Uh, 11, you will groan at your final end. Look at 18. Let your fountain be, be blessed. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving hind and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Not somebody else's breast, her breast. This guy over here just woke up. <laughs> what was that verse? What was that verse? It's in Proverbs. Proverbs 5, verse 19. Then he goes in 6. He talks about adultery again. 6.24, observe the commandments of your father in 20. 24, to keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Don't desire her beauty in your heart. Whether magazines or images or online or this, you gotta, you gotta cut your options. 
you got to walk away. Look at 32 of 6. The one who commits adultery with a woman is lacking sense. He who would destroy himself does it, and you'll destroy your family. And then in 7, he goes on. I saw the young men lacking sense, 7-7. Seven, seven. He sees the woman in the middle of the night. 18, come let us drink our fill of love until morning. My husband's gone on a journey, 19. He won't be back till the full moon. With many persuasions, 21, she entices him with her flattering lips. She seduces him. This, this is, can be a woman. It can be porn. 22, suddenly he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter. What's discernment? Discernment, this is what he's trying to do is give, give his son discernment. It's laying out the alternatives and the ability to choose the best. So, this is, uh, this is the battle we're in, guys. I, I, I need to say this again. When you talk about porn, I have to say this, because it's absolutely true. <clears throat> the, with pornography... For the Christian, there's embarrassment and shame and humiliation. Um, we don't want anyone to find out. But what you have to do with this is go public. Not public, public, but you've got to tell someone else. The only way that I've seen guys break this chain of pornography is to confess to a brother in Christ. Uh, as, as James instructs us, he makes it real clear in James 5.16. Because what will happen, this thing, you feel terrible about it, you confess to the Lord, and Lord, I'll never do it again, and then you do it again, and it comes back. Because the enemy won't let you, he'll just drive you nuts. 5.16, therefore confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can, can accomplish much. The only guys I've seen break the chain of pornography have done what they didn't want to do. They go to a brother they can trust. They confess their sin. And you don't want to do that because you're ashamed and you think he'll reject me. If he's a mature guy in Christ and you know he can keep a confidence, he won't reject you, he'll embrace you. And he'll... Uh, He'll honor you for, for being so honest because he knows how hard that is. And then, once again, you start praying for one another. You start meeting. You get the covenant eyes stuff on your devices and you get accountable and he gets a readout of your history. You get a readout of his every month. You start checking in with each other. How you doing in the word of God? How you doing in the scriptures? You see, and what happens is you start to grow. There are two things you can't do by yourself. You can't get married by yourself. I mean, at least not yet. I'm sure that's coming. The second thing you can't do by yourself, you can't live the Christian life by yourself. You can't do it. Jesus sent them out two by two. Galatians 6.2, bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. There's freedom, and it's around the corner. We just have to take the hard step. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. This is a battle. It is, um, and we can't win it by ourselves. Well, I, I thank you, Father, that... Um, I, I thank you that in Romans 8, it tells us that the Spirit of God prays for us with groanings too deep for words. And then later in that same passage, it tells us that Jesus 
is seated at your right hand and that Jesus prays for us and makes intercession for us forever. So not only is the Spirit of God praying for us, but Jesus prays for us. We belong to you and we love you, but we are weak. We need your help. I pray for each man that whatever step needs to be taken, that they will know that you are with them and not against them. And that they will trust you to take the right step and lead them to the right individual if this is what needs to be done. And that you'll make a way and you'll make a path and that you will lead them from immaturity to maturity. That's what you desire for every one of us. Thank you for your grace and mercy and kindness and graciousness to us. You're for us. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.